Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I will talk about the paper, and for anybody that wants it, it's, it's available here, or you can also go to the uh, uh, vertical section website where Tim has it posted as well. So if you want all the details, you can find it in there. <coughs> so what I want to talk about is suspension trauma, and because here I am at NCRC and we do education, uh, I thought I'd throw some objectives in such as describe physiology of suspension trauma, uh, define the terms crush syndrome, rhabdomyolysis, and compartment syndrome because they're terms that aren't used quite right, largely. Uh, list two consequences of prolonged passive suspension. Describe the controversy over laying patients down, and I think this is really the main emphasis that I'm taking here. Uh, at most rescue classes, people have heard the concept of suspension trauma before, but I want to go a little deeper as far as what we're thinking now in 2012. And uh, list two, comp two implications for packaging and patient transport underground. So suspension trauma has been called a number of different things. Uh, harness pathology, harness hang syndrome, suspension intolerance, orthostatic intolerance, uh, but all meaning the same thing. Um, I would suggest that we probably shouldn't be using terms that include the word harness in it because uh, I'm going to make the case that it's really not the harness that has much of anything to do with suspension trauma. And this is uh, something which is identified as early as 1972, so it's not really a new idea. Uh, it was identified in 72 by uh, the Europeans, uh, by the German-speaking Europeans, and then the French uh, cavers noted it a little bit later, but seemingly independently. Um, I'd also throw in that this is really, I'm, I'm approaching this from a alpine caving sport point of view. And I think there's still some unanswered questions from the industrial point of view because people in industry are typically using different harnesses than we do in caving and climbing and canyoneering and mountaineering. Uh, and so there's probably some room for debate about um, orthostatic intolerance or suspension trauma in the industrial setting, but I suspect in the end that we're going to say that it's all the same thing. Um, I think a good question, and I'll also throw in that this is, you know, my opinion about it all, and this is not really the NCRC party line on this. Um, but I think it's probably good to ask the question, to be skeptical of, of everything. So some people would say, this, is this real or not? And uh, there are people who, who don't believe in it, that think that this is, these are rare things that people have just tried to come up with some way to link them all together, and no, it is, it's not a thing unto itself. The, the problem with studying th this or anything else is that it's rare. And rare things are hard to study. I mean, if you have something that's happening every day, then you can, you can make case series and you can do all sorts of stuff. But when it's something which is happening, you know, one every year or every five years, it's hard to say. You need to put things together to study them, but it's not happening that often. Um, the other thing is that there's not really a common definition that anyone accepts. And I could say, well, that's a case of suspension trauma. And you could say, no, it isn't. And, you know, we can argue about it a lot, but there's no, you know, it's no standard that we can refer to to say, yes, that was or no, it wasn't. So it makes it difficult to really understand what's the pathology if you can't define what are the cases. And the cases that are out there, people have said, aha, this is suspension trauma, and there's, you know, room to argue about it. Um, but it's what leads to the skepticism of what is it really. I take the point of view that, yes, it does exist, and, and I'll explain why. And I have some ideas about how it ought to be defined, but you know that's again kind of my point of view and everybody else is free to disagree with me. So what, what it is, or what's commonly accepted that it is, is a state of shock. Shock, the you know, not perfusing your organs the way that you ought to. Um, that comes from blood accumulating in the legs from passive suspension. And, and the important part here is passive. This is not just standing around, this is not being in a harness, this is being in a harness and doing nothing. It is not moving the muscles in your legs. This is, you know, bolded, I probably should throw in a, an underline as well, but this is passive suspension. Um, part of the other reason that people say is this real or not, or it's, you know, kind of hard to understand, is that there's really more than one phenomenon here. One of what, the thing which has been identified really is, 
people dying in harness. And it seems to be a case of people fainting in harness or an early death from fainting while in harness. And I'll explain how that should probably work. There's also a syndrome of late muscle damage, which might or might not lead to some sort of rescue death afterwards. So it's really more than one thing. What it is not, and I think it's a common misconception, is that it's not just death from sitting in a harness. You know, remember that you know, when people have climbed El Capitan or people have climbed um, Half Dome and been in harness for days at a time, if not a week at a time, they don't fall off the mountain dead. Sometimes they do, but not from suspension trauma. Um, but people can be in a harness for a long, long time and they don't die from it. And so when people take a fall, it's not that you should panic, oh my god, I'm falling. Well, what happens when you repel? You sit in a harness. People don't die sitting in a harness while they're rappelling down a long pit that may take a couple minutes. It doesn't happen. That's because that is not passive suspension. So don't think it's like, oh, you took a fall and you're sitting in your harness and you're going to die now. Well, you're all cavers and you should be able to self-rescue from that situation easily enough. It's in other situations where people aren't prepared for that that they may have problems, but it's not just from sitting in the harness. It's from being passive in the harness and not moving anymore. So I, it's important we go over some terms so we have a, have a common, common set of terms here. And the one I want people to remember especially is this something called rhabdomyolysis, or among friends, just rhabdo. And what that is, is muscle destruction leading to muscle enzymes in the blood. So muscles are made out of cells like basically everything else in our body. If they get starved for oxygen, eventually they die. When they die, a certain amount of them will go pop or their, their membranes will grow leaky and the stuff that's inside will leak out. Um, the stuff that's inside, called myoglobin, can eventually lead to kidney failure. So it's a big deal. And we, we treat people in the hospital for rhabdomyolysis from a number of causes. Other terms that have been used sort of as synonyms for suspension trauma are compression syndrome and crush syndrome and compartment syndrome. Crush or compression is one way that people can get rhabdomyolysis. Compression is usually the drunk who's been unconscious on the street for a couple of hours before he's picked up and he's been lying on top of his wallet which has been pushing into the muscle in his butt and he's got no circulation there. And when they wake him up and take him to the hospital, the blood is going through. Um, that muscle, which is finally getting some circulation, a bunch of cells have died off, and there's a bunch of muscle enzymes in the blood. And that can actually shut down the kidneys later on. So that's compression syndrome. Crush syndrome is more or less the same thing, but more of an external, you're in a building and it collapses, and you have pieces of concrete that are going over your leg or somewhere else. The muscle gets crushed if you compress it enough blood can't flow through. If that lasts long enough, the cells die. When blood flow gets reestablished, the blood flow goes through, but now all those, all those cells are letting loose. Myoglobin gets in the bloodstream, can cause a lot of problems, especially in the kidney. So that's compression syndrome, or crush syndrome. This was first described in England during World War II when, when London was being bombed all the time and they were getting people out of, uh, out of broken buildings is they'd get them out and they'd be, they'd be healthy and they'd look good and then a week later they'd die of renal failure, of kidney failure. So that was crush syndrome, being crushed by debris. You could say the same thing for if somebody was in a collapse in a cave. Um, if the muscles get crushed long enough, the muscle cells die, they release myoglobin into the bloodstream, it can cause problems. Compartment syndrome is similar, but a little bit different. And that is in the legs, especially the lower leg, but also in the forearms, you have compartments. And this is especially between the two bones here. So you have two bones in the lower leg, two bones in the lower arm, and groups of muscles that in some cases are separated by not very much, but in some cases separated by this fibrous layer called a fascia. And fascia is tough. It's, it's not bony, but it's strong. And if you get some kind of damage in here that makes all this swell up, you get swelling inside a confined space that can't grow bigger. So if you whack your thumb, it swells up, but your thumb can swell up, so it's not that much of a risk. If you whack some of these muscles, 
They can swell up, but as soon as they swell only a little bit, the pressure in that compartment will go sky high. And once that happens, it will go, the pressure will go higher than your heart can pump blood through. So you get into that same situation of blood doesn't go through, the cells don't get oxygen, they die off, and if you ever can reestablish blood flow, you'd get leakage of muscle proteins into the bloodstream, go back, hurt the kidneys, do other stuff. So that's compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome really is a pretty rare thing. This takes like gunshots or, or motor vehicle accidents. You know, it's not something that's gonna happen, you know, from, from mild trauma. This takes serious trauma. Um, the, the treatment for this is the surgeons go in and actually will cut open these compartments. So they'll take, they'll open up the leg and release the pressure in there, cut up in the fascia so that everything can expand the pressure goes down and blood flow can go through. And it's something that you want to do pretty quickly because uh, there is kind of a time limit on this. But if somebody says, oh, I had compartment syndrome and they don't have a scar that's about yay long, they didn't really have compartment syndrome. Quick question. Yeah. So all the compartments can get it, or is it more likely in the deep posterior? It's the deep posterior is the one that, that you worry about. The, the, the other fascia, those are a little bit softer. It's the deep ones that are the big, big deal. So, rhabdo is what I'm going to talk about tonight. It's the general term uh, for muscle discretion by any cause. So, crush syndromes all have rhabdo, but not all rhabdo is crush. All compartment syndromes have a degree of rhabdo, but ought, not all rhabdo is compartment. And compression may cause rhabdo, but not all rhabdo is compression. So, we're going to talk about rhabdo and hopefully set aside these other terms that are, that are almost right for what we're talking about, but not quite really. So, suspension trauma. 1972, there was a conference in Austria, I believe, and uh, it was basically, it was mountaineering medicine. It was basically a, a bunch of pathologists that liked to go mountain climbing, as far as I can tell. And they got together and decided they'd have a medical conference, probably they could write it off. And so they had their conference and they all brought cases of things that they had seen, of accidents that had happened in the mountains. and. Um, Part of what they found is that they had, several of them had large series of people who had been mountaineering, had taken falls, and had died while on rope. Either, either on rope or sometime after being, being rescued from rope. And so they put those together and said, you know, and they actually proposed the, the, the physiology back in 72 that, that is basically accepted to this day. Um, a later, but, but independently, the French cavers, basically the French equivalent of the NSS, <coughs> said, hey, we have all these people that have died on rope, and a lot of them were in water at the time, which we all know is, is, is pretty deadly dangerous. But on a lot of them, they actually had a pretty good sense of, you went into the, wa the waterfall at this time, and you were dead at this time, and you know, hypothermia is dangerous, but that was awfully quick. And so there was some suspicion, is, is there something more than just hypothermia that was killing these cavers? So the French decided, let's study this. This is, this is like the, the medical section of the NSS, the French equivalent said, we're going to study this. And so they told some people, okay, well, climb up on the rope and pretend, you're, pretend to be unconscious. And in three minutes and six minutes, they actually were unconscious. So these were healthy people that were, were well fed and well hydrated that they said, climb up on the rope and pretend you're unconscious. And, and they soon became that way from nothing other than being on the rope. And the only difference is they were, they were pretending to be unconscious. They were passive. This is different because certainly French cavers spend plenty of time on rope, both going up and going down, and nothing like this ever happens, I guess unless you're in waterfall. Um, but in this dry, normal temperature setting, acting unconscious, they became unconscious. So at that point they said, hmm, maybe we should look at this protocol again and, and think about this. <clears throat> this was back in the days before human subject protection committees were all that active. They said, okay, they were going to do it again, but this time they would do it in a hospital, presumably with a, with a crash cart nearby, something that they could do about if somebody went unconscious, and they said, climb up the rope and pretend to be unconscious. And this time it took nine minutes, but they got somebody unconscious again. 
So at that point, they, they decided, you know, there's probably something more to this hypothermia on rope than just, more, more to dying on rope than just hypothermia, that hypothermia did not make sense. There was something more. And they did not use the term suspension trauma, but it's basically the same thing that the, the Austrians and the Spaniards had proposed earlier. And this is, this is a compilation that I've done of people who have died while hanging on rope. Um, the, a number of different things, training exercises, a lot of mountaineering, a uh, bunch of caving. Most of the caving ones come from the French, uh, but some of them are from American caving accidents. Um, the references on the right side come from the article which is available on the web. So you can actually go and read the, the primary source if you'd like to. The last three are ones that I've added since I published that article, and um, I don't have a reference to go with them. They're basically not published either. Uh, this is also an open invitation. If you have cases, ever run across somebody that you think might be a case, please send them to me and I will, I will add them to the lists and maybe that'll make sense someday. But what we can take from this, um, large amount of time, so we have six minutes to 24 hours, uh, but certainly a whole lot of two to three hour ranges in there, some less than one hour, fairly, fairly, fairly large range. Um, the last two were the autopsy report actually says suspension trauma. Um, I've, I've read the reports based on what they describe. I'm not absolutely convinced that it is suspension trauma that killed those people, although the, the accident reports said so. I think that they had some outside influence um, from hearing about suspension trauma uh, that made them write that. I'm not, this goes back to the, there is no common definition. So I'm not absolutely convinced even though the pathologist said it was the case, but we'll see. So what's happening? Well, <clears throat> Your heart's very good at pumping blood out to everywhere else in your body. But your heart can't suck it back in. It has to come back in. Now, it goes to your brain, it can go back down by gravity, that's easy enough. Um, for everywhere else, the way that blood returns to the heart, to the core circulation, is through the veins. So the veins collect the blood, but the important thing about veins is they have valves in them. They have some one-way valves so that when you're standing there, they can be open or closed. But when you squeeze, when you make any kind of muscular contraction, it squeezes those veins. And by squeezing the veins, you pump the blood up and it goes back towards the heart. So this is the important thing about passive suspension. If you're doing something, and actually you can like stick needles in people and you know, take readings of like little micro contractions happening all the time. And you know, somebody actually did the same thing and said, you know, basically said, you know, hang there and let me do, stick needles in your muscles and you actually lose out on some of those micro contractions when you're pretending to be unconscious. So with no contraction, no movement because you're just hanging there because you're hypothermic, because you are exhausted, because you've had some type of head trauma or because you're pretending to be unconscious, the heart pumps every, all the blood down to the legs and then it stays there because there's no mechanism for it to come back up. So your heart keeps pumping and your heart keeps pumping and your heart keeps pumping. You know, the heart doesn't stop, it just keeps on pumping. But what it has to pump becomes progressively less and less over time because all that blood is getting stuck down in the legs. Now, again, the skeptic should probably say, really? Well, there's actually some good evidence for this that, that no, we're not just making this up. Um, People, when people have studied this in the lab in a number of different cases, uh, you can see, uh, for one, if you just like measure how, how big around is your leg, you can, you can sit there in your harness and your legs, they get bigger and they get bigger and they get bigger. You can measure this difference over time. Um, your heart shrinks. Now, the amount of heart you have doesn't change, but the size of a heart on an x-ray is actually an indication of how much central volume that has. When somebody comes in on a trauma code to the hospital, one of the first things that is done is a chest x-ray. And it's largely for other things. You want to see do they have cracked, cracked ribs, if they dropped a lung, or if they done a number of things. So one of the things that you're looking at in that trauma code situation is how big is the heart? Because if it's a good, you know, heart size heart, 
that's an indication that there is still blood in the core and they've not bled out somewhere. On the other hand, if the heart is shrunken down, what you can see is a lot narrower than you expect. That's evidence that this person is really severely depleted. They've bled somewhere. It may be blood out on the street or it may be blood in their bellies or their thighs or, any, or somewhere else. But it says that, that they have lost volume. So if you hang someone in a harness and do like progressive chest x-rays, you'll see actually their heart size gets smaller and smaller on the chest x-ray. So their central volume is decreasing. Um, you can put electrodes on people's chests. And blood with, you know, fluid and salts and stuff like that conducts electricity pretty well. And air does not. And you can put electrodes on the chest and as people have their legs swell up with all their blood, the resistance in your chest actually goes up because you have less and less blood to conduct electricity at the same time that the air stays basically the same. So one more piece that you're losing central volume. Um, heart rate goes up, kind of expected. If there's less volume, you expect to see the heart rate go up. Pulse pressure goes down. This is one of the classic things you see, you know, the 120 over 80, the two, the two numbers for blood pressure, systolic and diastolic, as they get closer and closer together as someone goes into shock. So decreasing pulse pressure. Um, and really as early as 1972, uh, the, the Austrians or the Spaniards were able to show, you know, when people are in this condition, they're actually not sending as much blood into the kidneys. So there are like nuclear studies or other studies that you can show, you can quantitate how much blood flow is going there, and they're losing blood flow. So central volume is decreasing on a number of different measurements done by different people in different places over time. So really pretty clear, something is happening. If you're hanging, if you're in a passive suspension state, you're losing blood, it's going down to the legs. Now, what will help with this in most cases is that people faint. So the, the, the example that most people will know about is the, the, the soldier at attention. And this is kind of old urban legend that's out there. The other place you'll see it is like, you know, the marching band. You know, the marching band that's out on the field and they'll stop and play the national anthem and then everybody will walk off except there's somebody that's passed out on the field. Because they're being told, you know, you need to stay still, and that's part of the image we're doing, is we're all going to be rock solid still and not move a muscle. Well, it's that not moving a muscle thing that's dangerous. And if people stay completely still, they lock their knees, they're not doing anything, the blood goes down, and the central circulation gets less. So, in a normal situation, when that happens, is your brain likes blood. It likes oxygen, likes glucose, all that sort of stuff. So if you're not perfusing your brain, one thing that's come along is your brain will decide, okay, there's not enough, we're going to ground. And it does something called a vasovagal response, <coughs> you fall over. When you fall over, well, you're flat now. All that blood that was going somewhere else, it goes to your brain now. So. This is, this is a very adaptive response. If you go to ground, your brain gets blood. So, you know, our long ago ancestors, those that went to ground when they didn't have enough blood were more likely to pass on their genes later on. So, therefore, we faint if we don't get enough blood going, going, to, our, uh, going to our brains. This is a good thing. We like it. We don't want to change it. So, the mechanism of this is something called a vasovagal response. Um, there's actually potentially another fancier physiological thing going on that's hard to prove but, but is very interesting called a Yarish uh, something else, basal Yarish reflex. Um, but in any case, what happens is you get, first of all, as your heart rate goes up, as your, your body tries to compensate, your heart rate goes up and your blood pressure goes up and you're trying to get like, get blood to the brain, get blood to the brain, get blood to the brain. Eventually that stops and your brain says, okay, time to go to ground. You change to something called a parasympathetic response, which is a different neurochemical that comes from different parts of the body. But instead of speeding things up, it slows things down and relaxes everything so that your heart rate goes down and your blood pressure goes down and everything kind of relaxes a lot more. And if you've been fighting or this or that, that can be a great thing to happen because once you go to ground, then you can start perfusing your brain again. The problem is, if you're in a harness, 
and all your blood's gone to your legs because it's not circulating back to your heart and you've raised your heart rate to try to get blood to your brain and you've clamped down on all your arteries to get, try to get blood to go to your brain and then your brain says, screw it, we're going to ground and everything gets relaxed and the heart rate goes down so you can go to ground but you can't go to ground. You're in a harness. You're upright. You're still your brain at the very top. So now everything that's tried to compensate by putting brain here is by putting blood here is now putting blood down here. So even though you were tenuous to start with when that parasympathetic, parasympathetic response hits, when that fainting response hits, you stop circulating at all, potentially. So what happens? Well, if you can't fall down, your blood volume is already low, your blood pressure drops, your heart rate drops. I mean, this is really serious. You might die because you are not going to circulate blood to your brain. You've already used up your compensation mechanisms and you've hit the ultimate compensation. Except the ultimate compensation is going flat. But your harness and your rope won't let you. So that's why we think people have died on rope when, when they've not had anything else. They've not had trauma. They've not been hypothermic long enough. They've not had other stuff that ought to kill them. So, interesting case that was published. This is uh, published by a guy named Madsen, who I think was like in the Danish, Danish Navy. And um, this was a training situation. They had a group of soldiers together. And they said, okay, well, we're going to go practice rescuing you if you're on rope. Good thing to do. It's kind of what we're doing here. So they said, you put on your harness and you go around the corner and get on the rope and pretend you're unconscious. And so the instructor that was with everybody else was learning how to rescue him. They said, you know, do this, do this, do this. They went around the corner to rescue him, and he was dead. He took him down, did CPR, all that, remained dead. Six minutes is what they've published. Is that between being a, a healthy young soldier in the prime of his health, he went to dead in six minutes. Now, I, I wasn't there with a the stopwatch, but that's, that's what they're reporting. Um, that's about all I can say. There was no autopsy that went with it. Uh, basically, it was a healthy guy that died in six minutes when he was told to go on a rope and pretend to be unconscious. Now, what Madsen did, though, was follow up and say, well, what's going on? And um, he didn't put people in harnesses, but instead what he did was put people on a tilt table. <clears throat> and this is sometimes used in, for medical testing. And his tilt table did not have a footboard like this. It simply just had a bicycle seat up here. Uh, they were not in a harness, they were just simply on a bicycle seat and then they would tilt it at 50 degrees and they would see what happened. And he had uh, 79 people and within one hour, 69 of them were having symptoms of fainting. So things like heart rate going up, feeling nauseated, feeling cold flushes, tunnel vision, that sort of thing. I mean, they were, they were willing to stop it for anything. So nobody passed out because they were willing to put the table back to, to flat based on, on any kind of complaint. But um, 69 were pre syncopal within an hour, pre-fainting within an hour, and half of them were that way within 27 minutes. And again, re remember this point, no harnesses were involved with this. <clears throat> now, based on, on a lot of this information, that a lot, and a lot of it is really pretty old, <clears throat> The industrial people uh, were kind of concerned about this. So they were very much into the whole fall prevention and fall mitigation and what do we do when somebody falls. And in England, the health and safety executive, or HSE, which is more or less the equivalent of OSHA in the United States, decided that they were going to look into this and come up with some recommendations. <coughs> A guy named Paul Seddon um, studied this and he got together all the different evidence and had everything translated so they could figure out what to do about this. And um, at that point, um, he raised a concern for what was called rescue death. And this is, the pe this is what happens to people after they are rescued. And he, he came to a couple conclusions. <coughs> One of which was, don't lay them down after you rescue them and don't take off their harness. And this is kind of the thrust of what I want to talk about for the rest, rest of the evening is, is his recommendations, which very rapidly got taken up by all sorts of other people all over the world, from industrial trainers to other OSHA equivalents in other countries. Uh, and they all said, oh, oh, this is, you know, suspension trauma is a big deal and we shouldn't be laying people down, we should take the harness off. 
And that actually filtered into the NCRC, among other places. Because that, that was the best, that was more or less the only recommendation that was out there, and people kind of, people ran with it. So, what, they, what it appears they based this on was going back, they, he, <coughs> was going back to the 1972 stuff, you know, the whole collections of autopsies that, that he went through. And one of the patients that was rescued had been on rope for about four hours, young woman, prime of her life, and they rescued her and what they describe as a few minutes later, she was dead, without really good explanation of why. And she actually had an autopsy and Basically, there was nothing that could explain it. There was no head trauma, there was no lacerated spleen or lacerated liver or anything else that could explain why would this young woman in the prime of her life be dying just from, from being on rope. And they came to, the, came to the conclusion this is some kind of circulatory co collapse, but they couldn't put their finger on anything else. Based on that, on that one case, as far as I can tell, they came up with the recommendations of, you know, you really shouldn't lay someone down after you rescue them. And they did, you know, I'm not going to, Seddon didn't make all this up. They actually said this in 1972. Don't lay them down. Don't lay them down abruptly. They didn't define what abruptly was. Um, Seddon came up with 30 minutes for abruptly, but the, the people in 72 did not come up with any particular number. Um, and at that time, as early as 72, they were trying to come up with a, why exactly is this happening? And they came up with a couple, a couple ideas based on toxins in the blood or potentially a rapid return of volume to the heart. So these are the people that, that died after rescue. So they, they, they didn't die on rope. People got them off the rope. They were alive. Much shorter list, really. Uh, a couple of caving, a couple of mountaineering, um, mostly from the European series, but um, an American case or two thrown in there as well. Um, you know, some longer hang times. Three hours, six and a half hours, seven hours, four hours, three hours, four, eight, four. <coughs> so people that were probably on rope for a longer amount of time before they died. Now, remember, Madsen case died in six minutes. And, you know, French cavers on rope were fainting in three or six or ten, nine minutes. Um, but these were dead in a short after fairly substantial hang times with things on their autopsy like rhabdomyolysis. Now, 11 days later, that'd be pretty expected. <laughs> this was back in the days before dialysis was really fairly widespread. Basically had kidney failure after being rescued because of rhabdomyolysis. This was actually proven on autopsy. Um, a lot of unknowns, a lot of, a lot of the autopsies just said, we can't figure it out, there's no trauma here. Um, circulatory collapse. This is the young woman, 23. Four hours of hang time, died a few minutes, not defined any more than that, called circulatory collapse when, uh, when they did an autopsy on her. So these toxins that were proposed, a couple things were proposed. <coughs> uh, first one being myoglobin. This is the enzyme that comes out of muscles. And uh, when a muscle cell dies, it, the, the things that are inside it get released into the bloodstream. And it is, in fact, very toxic to, to kidney cells. They don't like it. Um, but on the other hand, your heart really doesn't care. Your, your heart can be perfectly fine with really bad rhabdomyolysis. Your kidneys hate it, but your heart doesn't care. So while myoglobin is, is absolutely the cause for long-term effects of suspension trauma, it's not the short-term rescue death villain. Um, people talked about acid. You know, when, when any type of tissue is starved for oxygen long enough, Metabolism change, you don't burn oxygen, you have to do, <coughs> do what you need to do without oxygen called anaerobic metabolism, and in the process of that, you start building up acids. And uh, in fact, this is done fairly frequently because if you look at people who have arthroscopic surgery, so probably in the room somewhere here, someone's had arthroscopic surgery from some torn meniscus, um, one at least, what they do during arthroscopic surgery, because surgeons really kind of hate blood getting into the operating field, is they put a tourniquet on the leg, which is really glorified blood pressure cuff, but it, it's a tourniquet. If you blow it up hard enough or high enough, it will stop blood flow. 
So they put a, a tourniquet on the leg or a blood pressure cuff on the leg, blow it up high enough so that no blood can go into the leg. And then they leave it there and they do their operation. And two hours later, up to two hours later, this is kind of the, the, ho, the ho hum level of doing this technique is two hours. And after two hours, they kind of release all the pressure and all the blood goes out in the leg. <clears throat> if you measure the pH of the blood at that point, it's down to 6.9, which is really pretty acidic. Normal blood is uh, about 7.4. If your entire body was at 6.9, it would be, you know, you're, you're in the intensive care unit. But having a leg's worth of acidotic blood is basically a, they breathe a little fast for a while and then you send them on. And it's kind of a no, no intervention necessary type of thing. And interventions like this are happening by the hundreds, if not thousands, every day in hospitals. With a up to two hours, ho-hum, nothing to do about it because there is no consequence to this. Um, now, what happens with pH? <coughs> Um, well, it doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, it affects contraction, so your heart doesn't really beat quite as strongly while the blood is acidotic, but it doesn't change heart rhythm. So the whole, like, if, how are you going to you know, stop the heart to kill someone? It, it won't do it. it. It will make it beat a little bit less strongly, but it does not stop the heart at all. <clears throat> now, potassium... It's so one of the minerals that are minerals that's in your blood, and it's also a lot more concentrated inside the cells of your body, including your muscle cells. And so, when you develop rhabdomyolysis, one of the other things that happens is you release potassium into the bloodstream. And in fact, elevated potassium levels can can stop your heart. This is <coughs> in states that have the you know death by injection. That's the thing that they do to do the final. Now we're stopping your heart part of it, part of the protocol. So um, that is a potentially real thing, that if you have a flash of high potassium coming back, that can in fact stop the heart at some point. And there's actually evidence <coughs> to support that if you look at crush victims, you know, people that have been trapped by earthquake debris that are then brought out from the rubble, um, you know, in fact, they do have very, very high potassium levels, and part of the protocols that have been developed for them is get some bicarbonate into them quickly so that you can decrease the, the potassium level, and it, it's actually quite effective. So potassium is potentially a, a very real cause of a, of a rescue death after release from, from suspension. So if, if we know maybe a cause, we should think about, well, how can we prevent it from happening? Well, according to Seddon, he said, don't lay them down, which is more or less quoting what the, what the Europeans had said earlier. And he also said, don't take off the harness, which was, he kind of said that on his own authority. And again, this kind of all went out into the rescue community and the industrial, industrial community. Um, the things that are generally accepted we ought to be thinking about are well, let's get them down. Get them down now as soon as possible because the longer they hang passively, underline passively once again, um, the longer, the more damage can accumulate. So we want to get them down now. Um, if we can give them some IV fluid, that's fantastic. Um, normal saline is great. Um, if you can do like half normal with some added bicarb, that's, that's good too. Um, these are protocols that come from the earthquake literature. What do you do after an earthquake if you're rescuing people that have been crushed? Well, you give them saline and then you give them, you alternate that with um, half normal with some bicarb added to it. Um, on the other hand, we don't want to wait for fluids to get someone down. In the earthquake situation, frequently they'll try to like get the IV fluid going um, and then take the debris off afterwards. And <laughs> it's kind of unproven whether that's a good idea or not, but probably doesn't hurt. Um, but their capacity for starting IV lines and somebody that is on rope is probably pretty low and we should just focus on getting them down. And if there's IV fluid available, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, there was at least one rescue in TAG where they managed to get IV fluid into the, uh, uh, into the cave and give it in the cave. That was one that, uh, that uh, Dave Wharton was involved with. Um, when I sent my article in to, uh, to be published, uh, they said, oh, this is really unrealistic. How are you going to get IV fluid out into the field? Kind of wrote back, 
well, they did it in a cave. If they can do it in a cave, they must be able to do it, you know, all these other places too. And they'll let me keep saying that in the article. Thank you, Dave. Um, so what do we do about it? If somebody has been um, hanging for more than two hours, they probably are getting to the zone where renal failure is a possibility. And those people really should be getting checked out. They, they should go to an ER. Less than two hours is kind of hard to debate or hard to say. So the other thing was concerned is volume. So the idea being that, well, all this volume has gone down into the legs and it's kind of stuck down there. And all the volume has left, left the chest or the trunk and it's gone and the heart's kind of shrunk down. So if you lay them flat, this is their thought, is if you lay them flat, then all that volume is going to rush back into the heart and do something bad. Nobody's ever really been able to put their, put their finger on that. Um, If you read the internet, and if it's on the internet, it must be true, right? Sure. Yep, obviously. I mean, if you read the internet, I mean, they'll say that if you lay someone down, you know, their heart's going to rupture. No, really, I've read this. People have put the, the heart's going to rupture. It's not going to rupture. But the concern being raised that if you let, lay someone flat, somehow that is going to put so much volume into their heart that it's going to cause some bad thing to happen. And in fact, you can, you can infuse, they've done some experiments, <coughs> where you take saline and just infuse it really, really fast and see what happens. And what you see is that, well, you do get some rhythm disturbances, some irritability, what people would call, except they're exactly the same things that you would see if somebody is stressed. So if they're stressed, they have a little adrenaline going, that whole sympathetic response that you'd expect from somebody being like scared, in pain, um, on rope too long, adrenaline dump, you can see exactly the same thing. So that you see it when you infuse saline, you know, when you were climbing the rope the last time, you probably had similar cardiac irritability. And I think really the main thing that kind of argues against this whole volume thing is you just don't see this anywhere else. I mean, they have, they're probably their whole body blood supply, their volume is, is whole body low anyway. And if you lay someone flat, you'd be lucky to get them back to a normal volume, let alone an enlarged volume. And think about all the things that people do. I mean, forget about laying flat. What about people that are upside down, that are standing on their heads, that are doing cartwheels, that are doing somersaults, that are in the gym right now and deciding, hey, I can put my feet up above my head. Ain't I cool? You don't see piles of bodies in the playgrounds of America. They're not there. You know, nobody's telling their kids, don't do any cartwheels at school, you're going to die from your heart rupturing. It doesn't happen. You know, think of a diver. So now you have the heart here and a big column of blood with all the valves pointing this way and somebody that's completely hydrated and they hit the water and their blood is going to go slamming into their heart and you know what? At the Olympics, they don't have piles of bodies either. It doesn't happen. So it's not the volume. So is it safe to lay them down? Um, well, in my article I said it's perfectly safe to lay them down, uh, but it, don't take my word for it. There have been at least three independent reviews from three different countries where they went and looked at every piece of evidence that they could find to say, is there any evidence at all to support this don't lay them at down idea? And in fact, all of them came to the same conclusion of there's absolutely no evidence to support the recommendation, the, the don't lay them down recommendation. It's, it's just not there. The organization that published Seddon's uh, recommendations, the don't lay them down, don't take their harness off, HSC came out and said, um, do overs? We changed our mind. Um, treat them like you would treat any other trauma patient. OSHA, based on HSE, OSHA, if you read their, their handout, their bulletin on suspension trauma said, some authorities say you shouldn't lay them down right away and should, I don't know if they said the 30 minute thing, but this, this, some authorities say you shouldn't lay them down right away. Kind of left it at that. Based on HSE retracting what they were basing their own recommendations <clears throat> um, in, April of last year, OSHA retracted that. Basically, they took that whole bulletin down off of the web. And in November of last year, they put it back up saying, treat them like you would any other trauma patient. 
don't, you know, the don't lay them down thing. Just treat them like any other trauma patient that you find. Um, Mountain Rescue Association also says treat them like any other. And ICAR, which is International Mountain Medicine Grouping, is going to come out and say that, although they haven't done it yet, not officially. But you might say, okay, the authorities, they don't quite agree, but my protocols say it would make me feel better if I don't harm them. So what if I just, would it harm anybody to lay them down? Well, remember in Madsen, he put people on a tilt table on a bicycle seat with no harness and put them at, at 50 degrees. What, what'd Seddon say? He says, we'll have them sitting down and put them laying back at 45 degrees. So basically the old recommendation to not lay them down was put them at 45 degrees, which is basically replicating what Madsen did in the laboratory on the tilt table, which made people faint. So that recommendation is actually putting them into the situation that Madsen was able to demonstrate this is harmful. You're recreating the same problem that they had before. So yeah, if you don't lay them down, you can harm them. Um, other evidence from vascular surgery, you know, vas the other vascular surgeons, they, they need to operate on, on big blood vessels. What do they do? They clamp it. And it's really pretty clear that, you know, they clamp it, they do their operation, they unclamp it, they let the blood go through again. It's very clear that the longer you go, the longer you wait, the more damage you will do to muscles that are downstream. Now again, two hours is not that big a deal for most muscles, but the longer you go, the more likely it is that when you have the blood flow go back through that you will develop problems with muscle death. So you want to get it done as quickly as possible. So. When do you want to restore blood flow? Right away. You don't want to wait. Yes, it could harm someone to wait 30 minutes. <clears throat> what about the harness? This is Lord Voldemort caving with his legs cut off. <laughs> Seddon says to take it off slowly. Doesn't really define what that meant, but said slow would be good. And I've, I've sat around and watched people debate exactly what did slowly mean. It's like, well, you, you kind of loosen it a little bit and then maybe you kind of undo something and it's, nobody, nobody really knows. Um, the reason that, that I put forth is that the harness is not the thing here. This is where the big vessels are that, that make, a, make a difference. <coughs> so this is your femoral artery. This is your femoral vein. These are the big, these are the big vessels that carry blood out to the leg and then bring it back. Well, if you're in a harness, it wraps around the back so you can sit there and then gathers it up this way. Well, yeah, you have this tourniquet effect everywhere except where the blood vessels actually go. So, the, the harness is not at fault. The harness does not compress your arteries and your veins that's the place where you have the best flow. If you don't believe it, go get on rope tonight or tomorrow and go have somebody feel for your pulses. They're there. So what should you do with this? Well, you can do whatever you want with it, but if you want to leave it on because you, 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 your protocol says so, that's fine because I don't think it makes any difference. Um, if you want to take it off, that's fine, because it really doesn't make any difference, and you can be as slow or quick about it as you want, because really it doesn't make any difference. Um, the vessels are not being affected, they're not being squeezed by your harness. Feel your pulses the next time you're on rope. And this is why I think that terms that use harness should probably be avoided. It's not harness hang, it's not harness pathology, it's not the harness. It's being suspended passively that does the damage. So this is going back to, remember, this is the same thing I showed you earlier. These are the people who died after they were rescued. If you look at the, the two to look at here are in red. And this is a young woman who died, this mountaineer on rope died, four hours on rope, died a few minutes later. And a caving case, four hours suspended, died minutes later, no, no autopsy available. Neither of them were wearing a sit harness. 
The Mountaineer, this was back in the probably late 60s, early 70s. It was back in the days when people were climbing everything with nothing more than a Swami belt. It's very interesting to read the mountaineering doctors talking about, oh, and we see that in the Swiss, they're actually thinking you should put something around the legs. It's very, very dangerous, the barbarians. Um, so this was back in the days where you had something around your belt and around your waist and that was it. There was nothing around her legs. They did not release a harness when they rescued her. The caving case, this is from the modern era, yet this caver was somehow jugging without a sit harness. And I don't quite get how that happened, but that's how the accident report reads, that he was jugging with just a chest harness, without a sit harness, got pretty high up the rope, got stuck there pretty high up the rope, got rescued, and then died. But he was not wearing a sit harness. So that really, the two cases that I've been able to identify that are out there where somebody died after rescue, neither of them were wearing a sit harness. So it's yet one more thing for me to say, it's not the harness. It's not the harness which is doing this. They, di they died despite rescue, not because of rescue. We need to get people down, we need to take care of them, but it's not the harness. So, what are the implications of this? Well, first of all, know your rope work. Thank you all for coming to NCRC. Uh, practice it. Practice it over and over. Be good at it. Um, <clears throat> I think there's some big implications for us when we're teaching rescue. You know, really, from a medical point of view, we should really put people into a horizontal position, do horizontal lifts on people, unless there's really good reason not to. Um, that, that is a much safer position, especially for anybody that's at all unconscious. And really, the vertical lifts that we teach, I mean, there's plenty of good reasons where we absolutely have to do a vertical lift. And vertical lifts are a lot easier to do and have lots of good reasons for doing them. But if you're lifting an unconscious patient, that really does have some dangerous implications. And we need to be careful about that decision. It's not, it's not a nothing decision. We, there, there are medical implications to this. So we need to be careful with it. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the way that we're, we're packaging, the leg loops that we put, in pe we put in the litter, it's not just for comfort. It's not just to prevent people from falling down in the, liver, in the litter. Um, I really think that this has implications for preventing suspension trauma. You're giving somebody that they can put something they can push against. And if they can push against it, they can get that blood flow coming back up towards their heart where they need it. So the leg loops that we're teaching people to do, I think that they're really important and it's not just comfort. It is actually a big deal medical type of thing. Um, other implications, um, you know, when we're doing training, and we do this already, and probably most people do this already, but we're doing training, we need to be, we need to be, have a way to get people down if they're having problems and you know you go to the gym right now every every rope is tied off in a way that we can lower it one way or the other and, and that's appropriate um, I guess I would ask the question though why not in other situations you know if you are rappelling somewhere and you have a bunch of extra rope the, the place is not at the bottom of the drop where that extra rope ought to be it should be at the top of the drop so that you could lower someone and why not rig it in a way that you could just like you know untie a knot and lower them down. That's not common practice. I, I'll, I'll admit I don't do it, sorry. But I, that's one of the things that we as a community might want to examine. You know, it's something in the canyoneering, <coughs> canyoneering community, that's kind of what they do. Not for this reason, because they're typically doing more pull down trips, but you know, it's something that we might well want to think about. And when it's an option, you have the, you have the hardware, maybe we ought to be rigging this way and not just Drop, drop a figure eight on top of a carabiner that's awfully hard to get undone. Um, so to summarize, suspension trauma, short-term death, basically death by fainting uh, while suspended and it's passively suspended. Uh, potassium levels might have something to do with the death um, as well, especially for people after they're rescued. Um, there's a medium-term muscle death by starving muscles of oxygen. <coughs> this can lead to kidney failure on a more long-term basis. You know, this is like several days out that people develop kidney failure. Um, what should we do about it? Well, we should get them down. We should lay them down. Uh, we should give them fluids if we at all can. Um, and we should not worry about the harness because it's not really harness hang syndrome, it's suspension trauma and it's not about the harness. <coughs>